Okay, so we inhabit an age of circulating flesh, fractal flesh and phantom flesh. And what I mean by circulating flesh is that we can extract organs from dead bodies and insert them into living bodies. We can stitch the hand from a cadaver to the arm of an amputee and reanimate it. By fractal flesh, I mean bodies and bits of bodies and brains spatially separated but electronically connected, generating recurring patterns of interactivity at varying scales. And that's just a simple definition of the internet. And by phantom flesh, I mean that increasingly we're performing online as our phantoms. Uh, not phantoms as in phantasmatic, but phantoms as in phantom limbs. Uh, with the increasing proliferation of haptic devices on, online, we'll be able to, to get uh, experiences of force feedback. We can now preserve dead bodies uh, forever uh, with plastination, whilst simultaneously um, sustain comatose bodies on technological life support systems and um, cryogenically preserve bodies to awaken them at some imagined uh, future. So uh, dead bodies need no longer disintegrate near, uh, and dead bodies continue to have a material existence. So there's a new experience of materiality um, that is generated. I think what artists do best is to generate uh, contestable futures, uh, futures uh, with uh, contingency. You know, a future is not a future if it's not of the unexpected. Uh, between 1976 and 1989, I did 27 uh, body suspension performances. I guess looking back, uh, exploring the psychological and physiological uh, parameters of the body um, until physically exhausted. Um, here the body is on a, a counterbalance by a ring of rocks, each rock connected to um, an insertion point. Uh, I was gently swaying from side to side, setting up random oscillations in the rocks. Uh, this performance was terminated uh, when the telephone rang in the gallery. <laughs> uh, hoisted up and down an abandoned lift well. Um, this performance was done, uh, one of the few done in Australia. And on an outcrop of rocks about 300 metres from shore. Uh, this was in uh, Jogashima. Uh, when we began preparing the suspension, there was a group of fishermen on another outcrop of rocks. They were fishing, in fact, before we arrived. They kept fishing during the performance and they were still fishing uh, when we left. Um, one of the few public performances uh, most of the suspension events were done in remote locations or private gallery spaces. Uh, this was part of a festival where uh, the body was uh, hoisted up 60 metres uh, using a large crane. After about 30 metres, all you could hear was the, was the uh, whooshing of the wind, the whirring of the crane motors, and the creaking of the skin. <laughs> so these suspensions are experiences in bodily sensation expressed in bodily action. And they're done in remote spaces in diverse situations. They're not actions meant for interpretation, nor do they require any explanation. They're not uh, meant to generate any meaning. 
the body neither up nor down uh, is always in a state of in between. I guess the desire, uh, having explored the physical parameters of the body, uh, there was a desire to augment the body. Um, the third hand was the uh, first um, augmentation. Uh, this is a three degree of freedom uh, manipulator uh, with a tactile feedback system uh, for a sense of touch. Uh, initially just uh, meant as a visual attachment uh, for performance. And um, this idea that um, we've evolved as soft biological bodies uh, to um, inhabit a, a, a biological and natural world, but as we're increasingly inhabiting a technological terrain of fast, precise and powerful uh, technologies. We need to engineer additional external uh, uh, interfaces. And uh, this idea of technology as the external organs of the body, um, I think is a good one. It gets us away from uh, seeing technology as a kind of alien other. Uh, this performance began when the body was switched on and ended when the body was switched off. Uh, the body's amplified brain waves, heartbeat, blood flow and muscle signals were augmented by the sounds of the third hand and lasers were directed to the eyes using optic fiber cable. Um, this is a performance in 1986. And by controlling the muscles around the eyes, you could literally scribble uh, with the laser beams uh, in the gallery space. So a prosthesis here is not uh, a sign of lack, but rather a symptom of excess. Uh, here the body is writing one word simultaneously, each hand writing a separate letter. Um, and I had to keep my two eyes on, on what my three hands were doing. Um, and because this uh, performance was on a sheet of glass uh, between the artist and the audience, I had to learn to write it back to front, uh, learning to write every third letter uh, because of the spacing of the three hands. Uh, the extended arm was a manipulator that extends my right arm uh, to primate proportions. It ends up uh, providing an additional joint to the arm, um, 11 degrees of freedom, uh, as well as wrist rotation, wrist flexion, uh, thumb rotation, individual finger flexion. Each finger actually splits open. Each finger uh, can potentially be a gripper in itself. This performance was for four hours continuously. Uh, the performance was streamed uh, live and uh, we had constructed a, a 3D model of the mechanism uh, and the mechanism uh, uh, mimicked, uh, was mimicked by the, the 3D model. So online you would see the, the streaming video of the performance um, and the 3D model uh, mimicking the manipulator. Uh, those sounds were not internal body signals, 
but rather sounds generated by flexor, tilt, uh, and proximity sensors on the limbs of the, of the body. So um, a zombie is a body that has uh, uh, no mind of its own that performs involuntarily. A cyborg is a human machine system that becomes increasingly automated. We've always feared the involuntary and we're anxious about becoming automated, but in fact, we fear what we have always been and what we've already become. We've always been bodies without minds of our own. We've always been bodies prosthetically augmented by our artifacts and instruments. Um, oh, uh, <clears throat> it didn't take much imagination to think that um, if I could uh, program my body to perform in a local space, computer control it, this could be done remotely. This is a muscle stimulation control box, the blue switches indicate which muscles could be programmed. By touching uh, the muscles on the computer model, the computer model mimics what you've just programmed. And a second later in Luxembourg, where my body was, my body moves involuntarily. This was a performance in 1995 for two days, six hours every day, people in the Pompidou Centre in Paris, the Media Lab in Helsinki, the Doors of Perception Conference in Amsterdam, for example, were able to remotely access and remotely activate uh, my body in Luxembourg. The body has a kind of a split body experience, not a split mind and body, but a split physiology. Uh, the left side, voltage in, performing involuntarily. The right side, voltage out, uh, controlling uh, a mechanical hand. So pr presence has now become uh, problematic. Uh, presence is now marked by what you would uh, call a double absence, or perhaps absence is marked by a double presence. We are neither all here nor all there, but partly here sometimes and partly somewhere else at other times online. Instead of people in other places remotely actuating the body, uh, we use the ping protocol in this performance, pinging 40 global locations. The reverberating pings coming back to the host computer measured in milliseconds mapped to the body's muscles. So the body becomes this kind of crude barometer of internet activity. And with uh, Parasite, um, here we, cuss we uh, uh, engineered uh, a search engine uh, that scans the net, selects anatomical images from the web, uh, projects them to my head up display and the body uh, moves involuntarily to the images that it sees. So uh, tilt sensors on the arms, legs and head enable the body to become the live video mixer and video switcher uh, of the streaming performance. So by tilting my head uh, as the arms move involuntarily, um, the video, uh, uh, um, uh, videos uh, cameras are switched. So we have a kind of an aesthetic surveillance system that the artist is manipulating uh, during the performance. So the images that you see are in fact the images that move your body. Uh, the Movitar performance was an inverse motion capture system. 
instead of your body manipulating an artificial entity or an avatar, uh, here an avatar can access the upper part of your body and perform with it in the real world. Uh, the avatar is imbued with genetic Hamburg in 90, 1997, uh, we engineered a robot, uh, robust enough uh, to support the artist's uh, body. And the artist's uh, arm gestures uh, could select uh, the walking uh, leg movements of the robot. So by making different arm gestures, the robot could walk forwards and backwards with a ripple gait sideways with a tripod gait, the robot could squat, it could stand, it could turn on the spot. Uh, so this was very much a, a sound machine uh, as well as a moving uh, machine. Um, your movements, your choreography uh, composed the sounds that were generated. So you were not only looking in the direction that you were walking, but that you were listening to the sounds that were being triggered. Um, the muscle machine was uh, exoskeleton, the previous robot, was three metres in diameter. Um, this, uh, this robot is five metres in diameter. So one, two, three, four, five metres in diameter. A very large uh, walking uh, mechanism uh, that effectively translates human bipedal gait into this six-legged insect-like locomotion. Um, how this is done, uh, encoders on the hip and leg joints uh, enable you to lift one leg, which lifts and swings forward three robot legs. So the robot is always stable on three legs, but by stepping up and down on the spot, 
uh, the robot uh, walks. The walking head uh, robot uh, was a, a kind of chimeric architecture with this human head displayed. It's a very, very uh, loud, uh, pneumatically actuated uh, machine. The rotating ultrasound sensor at the front detects if someone comes close to the robot. The robot then stands, selects from its library of possible movements and performs for about a minute, minute and a half, and then it sits down, goes to sleep, and waits for the next person to come along. It's a very loud robot. So the intent here was in fact to engineer an actual virtual system where the mechanical movements of the legs actuate and animate the facial behavior of the head. Microbot is a project that hasn't been realized uh, for all sorts of technical reasons, um, but it's a, a, a robot that is robust enough, uh, but small enough uh, to climb up your tongue and into your mouth. Um, I just have to be careful not to swallow. <laughs> uh, but this is really just a, a gesture towards the increasing intimacy uh, that we will have with our uh, machines, with our robots. Um, micro miniaturized and nano scaled, um, we can repopulate, recolonize the human body to augment its bacterial and viral uh, population. At the moment, the human body does not have an early alert warning system uh, that something uh, is pathologically wrong. Uh, by the time you feel the lump in your chest, uh, the cancer has spread, it's probably metastasized, uh, you know, your life is in danger within months. Uh, imagine nanosensors, uh, nanobots that can detect pathological changes in chemistry, temperature, uh, blockages in circulatory systems. Uh, it would be much easier uh, having detected them as a bundle of, uh, of early cells, clusters of cells to target and erad eradicate any cancerous uh, cluster. Uh, between 1973 and 1975, uh, and you might have realized that this is a, a non-linear presentation. <laughs> uh, it's kind of logical, but it has its own sort of logic. Uh, between 1973 and 1975, I made three films of the inside of my body um, in, into my uh, uh, stomach, the left and right bronchi of my lungs, and 90 centimeters um, into the colon. Um, the body, at, you know, having done that, I no longer sort of experience the body merely as a surface of skin bounding my, my organs and internal uh, 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 circulatory system. Uh, rather, you saw the body as a much more complex architecture of structures, spaces, and circulatory systems. Um, 25 years later, or 20 years later, uh, roughly 1993 for the fifth Australian Sculpture Triennale, I had the idea to design a sculpture for the inside of my body. Um, the theme of the Sculpture Triennale was site-specific works. <laughs> but, but instead of a sculpture for a public space, I decided to do a sculpture for the inside of uh, my stomach. Um, and uh, fully closed as a capsule structure. Uh, this could be safely inserted with the help of a friendly endoscopist 
um, into the down the esophagus and into the stomach cavity. The stomach had to be inflated with air to make this uh, safe. Um, once inside the body, the stomach sculpture opens and closes, extends and retracts, has a flashing light and a beeping sound. Uh, a very simple machine operation inside a soft organ of the body. So uh, here, the, the body is not a site for the psyche, nor for social inscription. Here, the body simply becomes a host for a work of art, a host for a sculpture. Uh, in collaboration with another artist, Nina Sellers, uh, both artists underwent liposuction, extracting 4.6 litres of their biomaterial, which was inserted into an installation uh, titled Blender. Blender is the sort of inverse of the stomach sculpture. Instead of a machine choreography inside a soft organ of the body, here, a machine installation becomes the host for a liquid body composed of biomaterial from uh, two artists' bodies. Uh, proximity sensors uh, in the sense in the uh, chassis detect if anyone approaches uh, the installation when they get to about, a, uh, uh, about a 50 centimetres. Um, the blender blades are activated, uh, blending the biomaterial. So in this age uh, uh, of body hacking, gene mapping, prosthetic augmentation, organ swapping, face transplants, synthetic skin, what it means to be a body, what it means to be human, and what generates aliveness and agency becomes problematic. So in the spaces of proliferating prosthetic bodies, partial life and artificial life, the body has become uh, obsolete. In the partial head project for uh, the Heidi Museum of, of Modern Art, the artist's face was scanned as was a hominid skull. Then there was a digital transplant of uh, the artist's face over the hominid skull, producing this composite uh, uh, form, a kind of third face, one that becomes post-hominid uh, but pre-human in form. The 3D printed scaffold was then seeded with living cells. Um, it, it actually rem remained alive only for several days before it got contaminated and had to be preserved in formaldehyde for the rest of the exhibition. But this partial head uh, is a kind of partial portrait of the artist, which was partially living for only a couple of days. <laughs> Actually, I've made a career out of being a failure. Nothing that I imagine turns out the way that it should. So interestingly, uh, McLuhan observed that when an old media is replaced by a new one, the old media becomes an art form. So art about the body is not only a symptom of the obsolescence of the body, but perhaps a symptom of the obsolescence of biology in itself. Uh, the, ear, uh, the, the extra ear project was initially imaged as an ear on the side of my head. Um, this was a dumb anatomical site to construct an extra ear. Um, uh, no surgeon would assist uh, due to the fact that there may have been partial face paralysis as a result. Uh, but in 2006, um, we did get funding and the assistance of three plastic surgeons to construct an ear on my arm. Um, this uh, porous biomaterial medpore scaffold uh, was inserted um, beneath the skin. Uh, the skin is suctioned 
over the scaffold, uh, over a period of about six months, you have a uh, tissue ingrowth and vascularization occurring. So in fact, the ear becomes a living part of your body. Um, it's still there. And, and if you can see it from that distance. So the intent uh, was in fact, and this was tested in the uh, second surgery, there's been four surgeries up to date. Uh, during the second surgery, we inserted a small microphone um, into the ear construct. And even uh, though at the end of the surgery, my arm is wrapped uh, with bandage, it has a partial plaster cast the surgeon speaks to the ear with his face mask on, his voice is picked up and wirelessly transmitted. So it's, it's plausible that this ear could be internet enabled. Um, the problem is a state of the art, it's not easy to do this. And up until now, I have not found a way of realizing this project um, and hopefully it will happen. But the, the whole idea of this is that it wasn't simply a matter of, of replicating and relocating the ear, but rather rewiring it um, to uh, make it into uh, a remote listening device for people in other places. An example of an alternative anatomical architecture. Uh, this ear is not for me. I've got two good ears to hear with. Um, hopefully this year is a kind of uh, internet uh, device, a, a remote listening device for others elsewhere. So the body in, in excess becomes this kind of contemporary chimera of meat, metal and code of, bi of the biological, the machinic, and the algorithmic. Uh, we no longer need to have this nostalgic um, uh, desire for a biological body. We all function uh, projecting our physical presences remotely with our wireless devices. We become really extended operational systems of which our biological form and functions form one component. Um, the extra ear project, ear on arm project, generated a, a series of other art related projects. This is a four meter long sculpture of the ear on my arm, a performance uh, for the lawn sculpture Biennale, um, lying on the sculpture, my body was simply um, covered with white slip, white clay, and it was very cold. My body was very warm. Uh, the clay begins to crack. Um, so this was really a counterpoint uh, between uh, a whole a body and a much larger fragment of the body, which was the ear on the arm. Whilst lying on this sculpture though, uh, I thought, well, perhaps it might be really interesting uh, not only to lie on the sculpture, but to suspend the body above the sculpture. Um, and in this performance in Melbourne, Scott Livesey Galleries, uh, I think it was 2012, um, we uh, rigged the body up. When it was ready, it was winched up. <laughs> So this performance begins when the body is hoisted off the sculpture. Um, when the body takes, uh, when the cable takes the full body, uh, the full weight of the body, because the cable is uh, braided, it begins to untwist. And as it untwists, the body begins to spin, first in one direction and then 
it spins in another direction. I thought the spinning might occur for five minutes. The spinning had occurred, occurred for about 15 minutes. In the propel performance, uh, instead of the body being uh, statically suspended but spinning, here the body could be precisely programmed. Its trajectory, uh, velocity and position and orientation in the space uh, could be predetermined. Uh, the sound is important in this performance. <laughs> uh, when the body finished its performance, the body was replaced uh, by a large sculpture uh, of, of the, the artist's ear and the same performance uh, was enacted. Um, what's interesting is that the robot that choreographs the ear is the same robot that carved the ear. The robot effectively was this six degree of freedom CNC machine. Um, so the robot that moves um, the ear is the same robot that, that produced it. So the body here becomes this extended operational system of bodily metabolism and machine musculature. So for me, there was always a ghost in the machine and not as a vital force that animates, but rather as a fading attestation of the human. <laughs> we can now produce instant skins, instant hyperreal skins uh, using uh, laser scanning or photogrammetry. Uh, uh, um, skins now become screens or screens become skins. Uh, we, we interface with uh, these flattened faces. And in fact, the body increasingly oscillates between its physical and phantom forms. And it's this oscillation, this quickening coupled with the optical thickening that fuses the physical and the phantom. There'll be a point in time where, where it's no longer meaningful to distinguish between our phantoms and our physical forms because operationally we'll be able to uh, perform uh, similarly in uh, both uh, 3D space and in virtual spaces. Stickman is a, a minimal but full body exoskeleton uh, that algorithmically actuates the body for a five hour continuous uh, performance, six degrees of freedom. Um, now the one leg is free though, uh, so I can balance on one leg, enabling me to uh, 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 manipulate my shadow uh, and also uh, modulate the video feedback that's projected. And in a recent iteration, we constructed a, a mini stick man, uh, which allowed uh, visitors to interact and insert their own choreography. By bending the limbs of the mini stick man, pressing play, uh, they insert their interaction into the performance. The sounds are a combination of pneumatic sounds, uh, the solenoid clicks, and also sensors uh, on the uh, 
a, a, a stick man exoskeleton, uh, which uh, uh, generates signals from its movements. Um, if no one is interacting with the body, there is a background algorithm that intermittently uh, animates. Um, the exoskeleton arm is a six degree of freedom arm that is um, engineered for the rewired remixed performance. Uh, this occurred for uh, the uh, uh, Perth Institute of Contemporary Art uh, for an exhibition called Radical Ecologies. Uh, for five days, uh, six hours every day, uh, the body could only see with the eyes of someone in London, could only hear with the ears of someone in New York, but anyone, anywhere, at any time, could access my right arm via the exoskeleton and remotely animate it. So here you have a kind of sharing of senses and a distributing of agency. Uh, uh, the performance that I'm showing is a, a, a more recent iteration uh, done uh, between three European cities. <laughs> So you didn't know what you were going to see, you didn't know what you were going to hear, and you didn't know when you were going to move. You were in three places at once, two virtually with your hearing and, and, and seeing, and one place physically. So bodies effectively become end defectors for other bodies in other places and for machines elsewhere. 
a reclining stick man um, last year for the Biennial of Australian Art, uh, a nine metre long, four metre high uh, stick figure robot uh, actuated by pneumatic uh, rubber muscles. Um, an online interface. Uh, in fact, this was the only installation during the lockdown in Adelaide where anybody could continue uh, to interact with the, with the installation at any time, 24-7. Uh, um, so the online installation, uh, the online interactivity, uh, by clicking uh, the switches, you could generate movements in the limbs and you could see the video streaming. There was a performance. <laughs> So this was a five hour continuous performance where the body is positioned on the torso of the robot. I can manipulate the limbs with a pair of pneumatic joysticks, uh, improvising with uh, local people interacting and people online interacting. So sometimes responding, sometimes prompting them uh, to, to do something else. The sounds that you're hearing are the sounds of um, the pneumatic, uh, 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 the, uh, the compressor, uh, the rotating droning of the motor sound, um, and a large uh, sort of anamorphic shadow is projected on the three walls because the robot is rotating continuously on its, on its axis. And so the shadows are, are distorting uh, over the three walls and the ceiling. Uh, and we had a kind of another aesthetic surveillance system. So you have to imagine the airflow uh, rubber muscles inflating and contracting, exhausting and extending. Um, I sort of imagined this as a kind of contemporary Pieta, you know? um, a human on a large robot. Okay? Uh, but Nina Sellers more astutely observed that the body here is merely a human strap-on for the robot. <laughs> and just as an observation and uh, uh, a statement about the, the, the COVID, um, at a time when the individual body can be threatened by fatally being infected by biological viruses, the human species is now confronted by the more pervasive and invasive risk of infection by its techno-digital artifacts, algorithms and entities. Uh, we can now 3D print using living cells. And if we can do this, it's going to mean uh, an excess of organs, of organs awaiting bodies of organs without bodies. In 2011, the first twin turbine artificial heart was implanted into the chest of a terminally ill patient. He only lived for uh, several weeks, uh, three, three weeks, maybe a little longer, um, but the heart was fully tested. Uh, what's interesting about this uh, more uh, smaller and more robust uh, artificial heart is that it continuously uh, circulates the blood without pulsing. So in the near future, you might rest your head on your loved one's chest. They're warm to the touch. They're breathing. They're speaking. They're certainly alive, but they have no heartbeat. And if we can engineer an artificial womb 
and bring to bear a healthy child, then life would not begin with a biological birth. And if we can replace malfunctioning parts of the body with stem cell grown organs, 3D bioprinted and artificial parts, then we need not die a biological death. So how do we define human existence as neither beginning with birth nor necessarily ending in death? In fact, we will no longer die biological deaths. We now mostly die when our life support systems are switched off or from some catastrophic accident. So what it means to be human is perhaps uh, not to remain human at all. The body that you are born with will probably not be the body that you die with. <laughs> uh, now, as a kind of footnote to the presentation, I do want to acknowledge uh, the work of the project team and the people um, collaborating uh, with uh, our anthropomorphic swarm structure. This is a, a commission by the Science Gallery for the swarm exhibition next February. So I, I thought of this as a kind of anthropomorphic uh, structure using pneumatic rubber muscles, uh, steel tendons, uh, there's a tensegrity structure, a skeletal structure of stainless steel, uh, struts and elastic cords. Uh, there's a stainless steel uh, spine, a circulatory system of compressed air. Uh, I'm just going to go through very quickly a couple of slides from the mid-review from the project team uh, that are looking at uh, the, the tensegrity structure and the way that it can be modulated, deformed, um, the electronic and mechanical system map, um, how this uh, structure will also be um, actuated by uh, gestures or the position and orientation of the body. Um, and the idea is that uh, your body's presence, uh, monitored either by a camera or a connect sensor, um, will uh, trigger swarm algorithms to generate a deformation, a modulation of the tensegrity structure. Uh, and uh, here's a little sort of animation uh, before being deformed. And the project team has come up with a tensegrity structure that can um, be deformed uh, in, in uh, two axes, a vertical and a horizontal axis. And this is in collaboration with Dr. Paul Lowe and David Leggett. Uh, the project team, lots of names to mention. Uh, Festo is the company that's providing the pneumatics, uh, the rubber muscles, and of course, thanks to uh, all of the people at the Science Gallery. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Stella, for the amazing lectures. Um, Susie, would you like to start? Yeah, um, yeah. Is... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I, every time I um, hear Stellar present on his work, I get something new from it. And I was taking a few notes, but I suppose um, for me, um, and from an art historical perspective and a humanities perspective, Star Stellar's practice is often discussed alongside the concept of posthumanism. Um, and I suppose for those of you not familiar with the concept, it's um, a, a kind of an expanded idea by philosophers Rosie Bray Dotty and, um, and Donna Haraway, challenging that distinction, the artificial distinctions we make between um, what is human and what is technology and what is machine or animal or nature. 
Um, and Stellark's practice clearly it poses a challenge to that in itself. So really aligns with those concepts. But I think what I always find interesting um, about um, the artist's practice is the illustration of how art can ask us to look again at the world we think we know and, and the, the facts that we think we know. Um, and instead start to see things in a different way. So for instance, when we consider um, how we are connected to the world, how our bodies are remotely controlled or our actions are remotely controlled, Stellark's practice is so prescient because every minute of our, or certainly every hour of our waking lives, we are in some way prompted by a remote force um, to act or to engage principally through our digital devices. Um, so I think there's something quite remarkable in that strangeness. Um, but yeah, I don't know from an art, so from design and architecture, if that uh, strikes yeah. you. I think it's just interesting what you talk about because we were talking very similar things within the unit that Stella is also teaching to with us in, uh, in the Melbourne School of Design. Maybe aiming towards pinching on, on what Susie's point is, on the last project that you just showed on, um, on the Remix project, where you almost given out all agencies to people around the world. You know? So you essentially, your eyes are being seen by someone. You're seeing what other people are seeing. People are moving you. Um, can you maybe, Stella, talk a little bit about the loss of agencies in the bodies and in the sense you're giving yourself up as a site, as in my mind, an architectural site um, that kind of pulls human bodies in, in the sense. Yeah, well, I, I'm actually seduced by, by, by two relatively contemporary uh, philosophies. Um, uh, Bruno Latour's actor network theory um, and uh, object-oriented ontology. Uh, they're both flattened ontologies. Yep. Uh, and more so than OOO. Um, but uh, that idea that, um, you know, your, your, your quality, like in, in actor network theory, uh, your qualities, your capabilities are dependent on your relationships in the network. Um, and I'm seduced by Graham Harmon's uh, definition or non-definition of an object that you can't reduce an object to its component parts, nor can you understand or evaluate it from its relations or effects. Now, why, why that is seductive is that uh, I've always considered the body as an object, hmm. uh, not an object of desire, but possibly an object to redesign. Yep. But when you talk about the object, uh, the body as an object, um, people want to associate you in that Cartesian uh, theater and duality of subject, object, mind and brain. Mm. Um, whereas I think with flattened ontologies, there's an understanding that your body is interacting with other bodies, other living things, machines, algorithms, uh, microbes, viruses, um, other living, living things. Um, and, and so it's a much more complex relationship. Mm -hmm. And so it problematizes the privileging of the human. Uh, and I think it sensitizes us uh, to um, other living things as well as artificially uh, uh, operational uh, devices. Yeah. Um, so that, that's what's uh, seductive. And that's what I take out of out of Susie's um, sort of promptings. Mm. Every time I look at your work, Stellak, I always have this sense that you flip the notion. Like, generally speaking, <laughs> we try and control machines, right? Like, we try and control the environment around mm -hmm. us. You know, architecture is a way of protecting the body. But you flip it in the sense that you allow the machine to control you from, you know, the reactions that we see even painfully, you know, even like that. I guess one of my questions, and maybe it's more of a philosophical question as well, is 
when you start giving your body to the machine and then you start hacking your body and then where does the human stop and the machine start and we always have the sense of a soul right like you know a human being has a soul at what point do we lose that or would we ever do we have a soul <laughs> I, I get i guess the 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 difficulty there is um partly one of language because language encourages us to speak as a subject uh, to say i do this i do that i'm an artist mm -hmm. and so on yeah. and so if we can try to negate that tendency mm -hmm. and just consider the body as a kind of an operational component in a much more complex ecosystem of other operational things whether living or machinic mm. um, then it's it's not a problem <laughs> you know it's not uh, you against the machine or uh, it's not meaningful to ask who's in control mm. because if if the uh, it reminds me of um, uh, Marvin Minsky had this uh, uh, the idea of telepresence you know um, if if you see what the remote robot sees if you hear what the remote robot hears um, it's as if you are present where the robot is. Um, uh, Sasumi Tachi, a Japanese robotics engineer, uh, sort of one up to Marvin Minsky. He talks about teleexistence. So if the feedback loops are much are more complex, if you not only see and hear what the robot sees and hears, but the robot does what you do, um, you have force feedback, um, effectively, the robot becomes the end defector of the body or flip it and you become the end effector of the robot. It becomes meaningless to distinguish uh, who's in control in any complex operational uh, system. Um, it, the issue is not who is in control. It's no longer the old paradigm of master slave mechanism, like the human controlling the the machine. So um, I think it's a problem of language because we're, we're, we're conditioned. Although in Japanese, you don't speak so much, uh, you don't preface every answer with an I. Mm. Uh, I mean, the word I is watakshiwa. Uh, <laughs> it's a much longer word. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so so it's it's a Western issue of mm. language, um, but I also that also prompts prompts me uh, to speak about um, uh, Wittgenstein and Nietzsche. <laughs> Again, my two uh, some of my two favourite uh, philosophers, uh, Wittgenstein, who says you don't have to locate thinking inside your head. Uh, thinking happens with the lips that you speak. Uh, with the hands that you write and in fact uh, actualizing your thoughts and memories in some kind of medium whether it's writing typing uh, photographing sketching uh, makes those uh, more memorable and also enables you to manipulate and elaborate um, so again this idea that oh uh, we have a uh, free will and free agency and uh we have a mind of our own the more and more performances that i do the less and less i think i have a mind of my own nor any mind at all in the traditional <laughs> metaphysical sense and um uh, nietzsche asserts that there's no uh being without the doing you know um that we assign agency uh, retroactively you know you do something and then I accuse you of being a criminal. Um, in a sense, um, we, we both of those assertions um, enable us to better understand and interact uh, with our machines. You don't have to uh, imply that a robot has some kind of complex internal mind if the robot behaves appropriately if it speaks adequately, uh, if it's sensitive to touch, um, 
if it responds in, <coughs> in, in ways that are socially acceptable, why should I distinguish uh, between uh, this biological body and that machine that behaves uh, and speaks and acts appropriately? I don't think it's meaningful to distinguish anymore. On, on the notion of language, we got a question online, um, which pick us on the fact that you keep in your lectures to reference the body and the artist. Sure. Um, <laughs> and is there a reason why you talk about um, talk of yourself almost as if it's a separate uh, yeah, person? person. Um, well, it's sort of boring, you know, listening to an artist talking about all of his performances and saying, I did this and I did that and I did this. Um, but but uh, uh, that's the flippant answer. And the more serious answer is that um, when I speak about a body, I mean this physiological, uh, phenomenological, uh, interacting, aware uh, body in the world. And uh, so I make no distinction between uh, a body and a mind. And uh, you, you are only looking at a body that speaks. You don't have to imagine anything else. Um, so um, that, that would be my, mm. my response. Well, on the question of agencies, we have uh, a really interesting ones coming through to talk about how, how much agency does the body actually has through future modification and prostheses as it performs, as you when modify your body over the years. Is there, is there really limitations or is, is there actually a finite end or is, is the body irrelevant in, in your instance? Well, well, the opportunities to, uh, you know, to attempt certain, you know, augmentations or limited mod modifications of the body, I mean, in a sense, they occur sometimes opportunistically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you meet a plastic surgeon, uh, you <laughs> befriend a plastic surgeon, um, they don't understand what you're doing. Uh, um, during the second surgery, um, one surgeon was overheard saying to another surgeon, uh, well, if this is art, we must be the artists. <laughs> and uh, fair enough, you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, ideas are easy. Ideas are easy. To actualize the ideas, uh, you need expertise. Uh, you, you need um, uh, a physical assistance. Um, so, uh, well, for example, this project that we're working on now uh, involves collaboration uh, with a number of people from different areas of expertise. Can I just check if there's any questions from our live audience? You might have to speak up, sorry. I now have to translate to the... The way you were talking before about it, it's the action of the machine or the human that defines it. I, I wonder how do you think of um, consciousness or awareness? Is it something that a machine can have? Sorry, so this for those online, this is a question about consciousness and whether machines can have consciousness. <laughs> well, of course, there's a whole area of consciousness studies of, and which I only have a very shallow uh, reading of. Uh, but uh, for this artist, um, you know, you can consider consciousness as inherently something that biological organisms have because they need it to interact with the world, right? So it's in a sense something that's given. Um, on the other hand, uh, one, one can sort of uh, look at the, the meaning of the word consciousness and perhaps uh, be more discerning and say, well, you become increasingly more conscious of, of uh, an operation or of other people's behavior or of a a social or political system uh, through uh, accruing more and more knowledge. Um, the easy way out is to uh, just simply uh, say that it's a result of, 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 of being aware of the necessity of awareness. 
which is the result of a multiplicity of, of feedback loops uh, between you know your body's sensory organisms, uh, your organs, and and uh, the stimulus that's coming from 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 the, the real world. Um, Do we have another? Could you anticipate the physical brain changing? Well, I, it's it's an interesting question, but of course, what's happened now is that well, uh, Darwinian evolution, and we possibly all accept that Darwin, Darwinian evolution occurs over a, a, an extended time span, billions of years, uh, with random, the occasional random mutation, and so-called natural selection, uh, and so on. Um, but what's happening? now is an acceleration of the means by which we can intervene, uh, not only uh, in engineering prosthetic attachments to the body or instruments that extend our sensory perception, but we're beginning to intervene genetically. We'll, um, take, we'll take two more questions if that's okay. Okay, yes. I think that's one. Is there a point at which you see this body of work not being connected to this body, sort of more in um, like the way that Anonymous works online, where it's a collaboration of ideas, but what's sort of at the higher point? That at what point do you stop claiming ownership of the work and it's just sort of going to sell ideas? Yeah, I mean, it's a. No, it's, it's a fair enough question. Uh, I think probably coming from another artist. Um, it's a fair enough question. I mean, my, my sort of definition of art is what happens, is, is, is what happens between intention and actuality, the slippage that occurs between intention and actuality and the incorporating of any unexpected developments, unexpected accidents, um, uh, uh, additional expertise that's added. Um, you know, I think the notion again of the kind of uh, uh, the individual artist, uh, you know, painting, you know, in a storm or uh, shut away. Uh, yes, historically, there was a time when that kind of art production uh, was was an indication of, of the zeitgeist of the time. Um, but that's no longer the case. I think to engineer anything meaningful and interesting uh, is often going to result incorporating um, these additional elements. It's the interesting thing that the, the, the public like the aura of the artist, there's no denying that you give an XR people know yeah I come back to no I come back to that statement that ideas are easy uh, actualizing the ideas uh, is a lot of hard work and a lot of additional expertise uh, so that's how I would I would respond um, We'll take one more question. Is there one from the audience? There's one yeah. just here. Um, the your work that the artwork has come from this kind of period um, where this work I think it's um, really curious to like see the connection between productivity um what's at this time um by the way that it's been interesting. I suppose we we are kind of approaching a future where Um, of like this class of people that have access to resources that are all meant to sell and they're not privileged. The economy is like super exposed to these people while at the same time we have this sort of like uh, underclass without showing any you know, personal network of people who are starving and are not dying in certain areas that were. 
I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying and I get the ethical issues involved in that question. Uh, the response really is that uh, history has never been uh, equitable. I mean, we never had a point in time where, uh, you know, we have equal access. Um, uh, it reminds me of, um, of, uh, um, of that statement uh, that the future is already here. It's just not equally distributed yet. In other words, um, uh, we're never going to have equal access and, and getting access to the most um, being privileged is not necessarily uh, beneficial. Uh, so for example, uh, the first heart transplant uh, lived only a few days. He was privileged uh, to, ha to have the first artificial heart trans you know, implant. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a really difficult, uh, difficult social, political and, and ethical issue. And, and uh, the trouble is, it's an indictment on our, on, our, uh, on our human species and our humanity, that even when something is rationally and ethical, uh, uh, we don't ordinarily, uh, we don't usually uh, apply that. Um, it, it's 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 a problem. It's a problem, but it's 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 how we manage. The problem for us is that with increasing um, complexity in our technological terrain that we inhabit, there will be increasing constraints. You know, because with increasing complexity, you can't operate safely or effectively if there aren't additional rules and regulations and constraints. Um, you will have more choice, but simultaneously more constraints. Uh, so how do we manage that? Um, you have your own personal laptop, you can hack, uh, you know, someone else's computer, you can hack my body if I have a, a chip implant. Uh, on the other hand, we can insert a device into the brain of a of a of a of a person with um, uh, with uh, not uh, not only Alzheimer's but uh, what's the shaking Parkinson's. Parkinson's disease and completely uh, return them to normal uh, behaviour. Um, so uh, we can insert technology in, into our bodies, but someone will be able to hack hack them as well. Okay. On, on that note of um, future is already here, but it's just not evenly distributed. William Gibson, yeah, Father William of Cybernetics. Gibson. Um, we will conclude this um, discussions. Thank you very much, Stella. Thank you, morning, Susie. Thank you. Thank you.